right, so go ahead and keep greeting our members as they come in, visitors. But if you're ready, if you're in your spot, go ahead and stand. Join us as we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. You ready? One, two, three. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. Y'all get me seated. Good crowd today. Maybe some people are anticipating something, but um, first, welcome, 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 welcome. Leanne, so glad to see you back. Um, welcome to everyone that's watching online and uh, are listening to us. And we just, we love this church here at 1548 Heights, and we want everyone that attends here to love it, too. Um, my name's Alan Kramer. We are supposed to say that during the welcome. I'm a steward here. And um, we want you to register on the card, your attendance, or online. You can do it if you're a member. You certainly can do it on here. You can do it as a guest as well. Uh, but most importantly, we want you to put prayer requests on the back of the card or on the uh, online app, because we want to pray for you. We have a group that meets every Wednesday, some more vocal than others, uh, but they meet every Wednesday and they pray over every prayer request that we receive, and we pray over it by name. Um, so we'd love to do that for you. We've got several things that we, um, we need to go over today, but first I wanted to read a scripture that was this morning's scripture, and normally I don't, I don't read out of the message, but I just love the words that, that uh, are in this one today. And it's from Hebrews 4. <clears throat> and it says, God means what he says. What he says goes. I remember that from my father. What I say goes. <laughs> and God is our father. His powerful word is a sh as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one can resist God's word. We can't get away from it no matter what. A couple other things before we get to the big announcement. Library class will start again next week, so we'll have the full uh, complement of classes in the library, in the prayer room, children's classes. So be sure and come for that. We do need worship volunteers. Uh, it's, it's funny when you go on and, and look to sign up 
there's a lot of blank spaces every time I go and do that. And I've, I've registered out months in advance for a few things, but I need, you guys need to, to go out and, and uh, register. It's real easy, it's simple, uh, unless you're technically challenged, and we can help you with that. Also, we need songs. Um, unless you want me to get back up here, I, like I told you last week, I've got 15 more, so you can listen to me for 15 more weeks. But otherwise, I'd like for you to give us the song and the story behind the song of why it was so meaningful to you um, through your life, currently, in the past, whatever. Uh, we just need, we need to continue doing that. We're going to do it through uh, April 6th of next year, leading up to that 100-year anniversary of this building. So we, we need you to submit some more. Okay, we have a photo of our new minister and his wife, I think. So that's, that's Kevin and Shelly Huddleston. And uh, I've, I've got a whole bio, but I'm not gonna read it. Uh, they are coming to us from San Angelo, Texas, where they've lived for 30 plus years. Uh, that's not Houston. Uh, as as uh, someone told me, the only thing San Angelo has in common with Houston is it's in Texas. <laughs> but Kevin and Shelley are a great couple, and they cannot wait to get here. In fact, Kevin told me the other day he was walking through the house, and oh, yeah, that's I remember when we when we got that, or when we put that piece of furniture here, or when we enclosed the porch, or added that outside and he said Shelly and my daughters were like hey dad get over it <laughs> we're moving uh, they have uh, they have married daughters one in Austin one in Kerrville a couple of grandkids um, they will be here soon official start date is September the 9th he will preach for the first time on September the 15th we will have a big celebration Sunday later, most likely the first Sunday in November. Uh, that's our target right now. Okay, so put that on your calendars. Um, there's going to be a lot of people here. They're going to invite a lot of family, a lot of friends. We're going to invite Matt and Angela back, David Fleer. Um, just get ready. I think you remember, most of you remember Easter. It was pretty full in here. I think we're going to be that full or fuller, which will be glorious. Um, now, they also were gracious enough to do a uh, hello video, and I think David has it teed up. So go ahead and play that, David. I'm Kevin. And I'm Shelly. Uh, and welcome to our home out here in San Angelo, Texas. Uh, wow, what a journey this has already been. Um, we have, we've worried and we've prayed and we've sweated over uh, this video. We wanted to say the right words and just get the right start. And at some point we realized, you know, that's kind of silly because we can't get this perfect. And so what you're going to get this morning, uh, this is just us. Um, we are far from perfect. We don't have the right words. Uh, we don't have all the right answers. Uh, but we believe we serve a God, uh, serve a Savior who is right. And uh, we look forward to joining you in a journey and uh, soon becoming a part of your home, which will then also be our home. And we know how much you have faithfully prayed over us and over this decision. We feel those prayers. We feel that sense of peace. And what we ask of you now is that as you have prayed for us in this journey getting to this point, that you will earnestly pray for us in this transition. And so uh, it's just us, uh, and we look forward to being with you uh, there in Houston. Uh, it is going to be a wild and wonderful experience. And I want to leave you with these words from Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 20. And it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. We look forward to being with you, church. 
And uh, we ask you to continue praying and to dream great dreams. Let's imagine together what God might do with us and through us, through all of us. And let's be confident that as big as our dreams might be, that our God is able and willing to do even more than that. We look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. God bless. Okay, so, yeah. Good morning, 1548. Uh, we are the Huddlestons. I'm Kevin. And I'm well, Shelly. There, oh my goodness. Um, so we have, we have a lot of the um, search team here today. Uh, search team members, I know, I didn't ask y'all to do this, but y would y'all stand up real quick? Uh, the, these guys, y'all can sit down. The, these folks spent more than nine months, 10 months now on this process. I know that might seem like it was a long time, but when we entered into, uh, into the arrangement with the company we hired and that brought us David Fleer, um, they told us when a, when a minister, and, and you know, we're an individual congregation. We're not part of any kind of association. We're not part of Southern Baptists. We're not part of the Catholic Church, Presbyterians. We don't have an organization behind us. We have us. And they told us when, uh, when you uh, start looking for a minister, um, plan on a month at least for every year they've been there. And if that minister was part of a, uh, the beginning or a revival, or renewal, you need to add a few months. So at 10 months, we're, we're doing good. We're, we're, I feel like we've accomplished a great deal. And um, we did that because it was God's will. God revealed himself. So as Kevin and, and Shelly asked, they want us to continue to pray. So we say we're a praying church. So I'm adding a prayer to the service this morning, but it'll be quick. So bow your heads, please. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the search team and all the hours that they spent working to uh, listen to you to find the right person for this next chapter here at 1548 Heights. Father, thank you for revealing your, your will to Kevin and Shelley and having them accept um, this challenge uh, to come here. Father, we thank you for all the great ideas that they've already expressed that they have for, for this church, for this community. And um, give us all here the strength and wisdom and honor to go along and, and help them in that journey to create a place here in the Heights that is a beacon of light for you. A place in, in Houston, a place in Texas, a place in the US and it, even in, around the world that helps develop your kingdom. In a time when it seems that's not so, so chic, uh, Lord, we just, we, we know that the people here have a heart for you and, and we just ask your blessing on each person here that's watching online. And Father, most of all right now, just uh, bless the Huddlestons as they prepare to, to move here. And we pray all that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You could be standing for the next song. I appreciate using the word create in your prayer because um, that's what I think one of the things we do is we try to create and not necessarily recreate. I know sometimes we can get caught up in trying to be like something else, something down the street try to recreate a moment, recreate a time. And God is a God of creation. He calls us to create. And one of the things that will not have to be rethought 
are re-envisioned is that Christ is our hope in life and death. I'm, I'm Stephanie Box, and um, like, like Alan, I have so many favorite songs, but the one I want to share with you guys is Prince of Peace, Control My Will. I am so fortunate in that there has never been a time in my life when I didn't know Jesus. My parents worked very hard to teach me right from wrong. And I always knew I had to forgive my enemies. And that was great because I was A plus at forgiving my enemies. <laughs> I was 
in my 50s before I understood that that was because I did not have any enemies. When somebody hurts your feelings or when somebody decides they don't love you anymore, that's not an enemy. But when someone I loved promised to lay waste to one of my sons, I knew what an enemy was. And for the first time in my life, I felt hatred. I had never wrestled with that sin before. And it, and it, it was a real fight. Um, it would flow up through me and, and, and there were so many people I had to deal with who could be terribly damaged by my fury and my terror. <laughs> and I would remember my Grammy and her singing this song and it was Prince of Peace, control my will, bid my struggling heart be still. And I would get on my knees and I would sing that, and I'm no singer, and pray that over and over again. And God did use those words until he took that fear and feeling of betrayal and terror away from me, and he made me love his poor broken child. Because however I felt, God loved this person. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the songs that call me back. Not that I ever lose my faith, but call me back to acting like I believe what I believe. And that's my song. If you want to go and be standing as we sing this song, that'd be fine. Prince of Peace, control my will. Bid this struggling heart be still. Bid my fears and doubting cease. Hush my spirit into peace. Thou hast bought me with thy blood. Open wide the gate of God. Peace I ask, but peace must be. Lord, in being one with Thee, may Thy will, not mine, be done. May Savior, at thy feet I fall, thou my life, my God, my all. Let thy happy servant be one forevermore with for sharing that hymn, very touching. And as Alan said, we need more, unless you want to hear his list on repeat. 
My name's Alan Pringle, and I'm going to be leading us in the initial prayer this morning. So, please pray with me. Heavenly God, let us recognize you as we praise you every day for our many, many blessings. Thank you for bringing us together as a church to worship in peace. We thank you for always providing a path forward. This church has persevered through many tribulations have only flourished. God, we also give you praises for the people that make this church so very special. For it is them that we exist. Also for them, we pray with full intentions to continue to bless each one with love, patience, and grace. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Let us continue to worship. This week I 
was thinking about doing communion prayer, and like Alan said, um, it was blank the whole week, so I was like, okay, let me go and step in, and one of the, one of the things about communion prayer is that you can't just wing it, right? You have to do your research, you have to reflect, think about the type of things that maybe we ought to hear, we ought to be reminded of. Uh, I think Stephanie said it earlier today that the song that she, that her grandmother liked or loved, it was a reminder. And human beings need reminders to come back to center. And as I was looking just to, for things to say and um, to share with the church this morning, uh, there was one, someone's article online that really spoke to me. Um, and I say that because as kind of like a plug for these roles that we have on a weekly basis, you don't have to come up with the words every single time. Sometimes you have to look for inspiration from others, and that's okay. I think in certain traditions, we have to say it from our own hearts and minds, but if someone else has said it before, then why not? So I'm gonna read from uh, an article that I saw that it was really a good reminder for me, and hopefully it will be for you too. After that, I will uh, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. We'll invite the church to come up and to take uh, bread and cup or body and blood of Jesus. And then we'll go back and we'll enjoy some songs from Bill and we'll continue with our worship. So this article is called Room for Others and it's based on the scripture reading for Matthew chapter 25, 31 through 46. The life of following Christ is not just about me, 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 me. The gospels challenge us repeatedly to devote our lives for others. Jesus equates serving others with serving God. All too often, though, our lives become consumed by our own plans. Our schedules may be filled with important, honorable things to do. Yet, we often risk focusing on only our own plans and missing out on the opportunities God gives us to make room for others in life. Matthew repeatedly stresses that if we love God, we will inevitably love others. In fact, if we don't love others, our love for God is in question. Love in action is not just for the people closest to us, but also for people who are marginalized, suffering, and in need. When we care for such people, we are actually showing our love for Jesus. For many of us, the thought of showing hospitality tends toward shared time with friends and family. But do we consider hospitality as an ex active expression of our own faith? The Bible calls us to welcome the stranger and practice hospitality. More than making room, hospitality calls for Christians to be ready even for the unexpected. While our deeds of compassion and mercy are not the means by which we enter God's kingdom, they show that we are part of God's family. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this morning we are joyful because of the news of our new minister, Lord, for this church. At this point in our service, Lord, we are here to take communion and to show that we remember you day in and day out, week in and week out year after year, Lord. 
And we sometimes need reminders, Lord, that go beyond us of our daily human needs, Lord. We ask that you, as we continue in this, um, this new chapter at 1548, Lord, that you feed us so that we can feed others, Lord, that you feed our spiritual health, our mental health, our physical health, and that we return that to our community, Lord. This, Lord, we pray in your son's name. Amen. So now, if everyone please stand, and we'll um, pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Everyone's invited to the table. Oh 
stand for singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated, please. And the children are dismissed for tiny fellowship. Good morning. It's nice to see those of you who have remained in town for the Labor Day weekend and who braved the weather to be here this morning. I'm Melissa Zenzitz, and I'm one of the stewards here. And I'm not one who normally gives the sermon. In fact, I've never done this before. But I'm glad for the opportunity to stretch a little and exercise some unused muscles. In general, I'm not a big fan of exercise, but I like to walk. And since my retirement, I've gotten into a pretty good habit of 30 minutes through my neighborhood each morning. Some mornings, I'm focused on the day ahead, and so I hardly notice my surroundings. But other days, I'm a little more distractible, and so I've seen some interesting things. One morning, I noticed a movement along the back of the outside of a, a car. And when I got closer, I saw that it was a sparrow fluttering up and down, down along the back window. At first, I thought maybe it saw its reflection and was trying to interact with it. But then the bird moved to a side window and the back and around the car, bouncing against each window. And the longer I watched, the more it seemed the bird somehow wanted inside the car. Why, I don't know. And occasionally it would fly to a nearby tree and maybe to take a rest or to get a new perspective, but then it would continue its attack. Unsurprisingly, it never made any headway. And it kept at it until a passing car finally frightened it away. I walked home thinking about that bird's frustration. For some reason, it seemed to want in the car, and it made every effort to get there, but beating against the window was never going to do it. The thing is, if I'd had a key, I could easily have opened the door and let the bird in, but it would never have hung around long enough for me to let it get in. It was impossible for the bird to get what it wanted because it would never risk my help. I thought about that bird when studying today's text, which is Matthew 19, 16 through 26. Would you please stand while I read? Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me? what is good. There is one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? 
But Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. May God bless this reading of his word. You may be seated. The young man had an idea of what a godly life should look like. He knew it required effort and dedication to gain any rewards, so he put forth all his energy into dutifully following the commandments. But every act of obedience left him unfulfilled. If he was doing everything right, why wasn't he getting the desired results? His life wasn't flourishing. It was anxious, striving, restricted. Maybe that's how he found himself in front of Jesus that day. Because Jesus taught with astonishing authority. Surely he would know the secret to a fulfilled life. But in Jesus' initial response, the young man heard the old party line. If you're looking for life, keep the commandments. Sure, Jesus put a new emphasis on loving your neighbor, but it was pretty much the same message he'd heard since childhood. And he had spent years doing the right things, so he knew the frustrations of that life. Following the commandments didn't match up with the engaged, fulfilling life he had in mind. So he pressed Jesus for more. What effort, what achievement would give him the payout he knew had to be there? He was that bird beating against the car. With a glimpse of what eluded him, but sure that if he hit that window long enough and hard enough, he would find a way in. But Jesus didn't give the commandment he expected. Jesus pared the commandments down to their core, loving God and loving your neighbor. If he wanted to be perfect, fully developed and brought to completion, he should give everything to the poor and find his treasure in following Jesus. The answer was simple in its clarity. Just two things, give up everything and follow Jesus. There was no way to misunderstand what was asked of him. No way to pretend he hadn't heard clearly. But while the young man had been fixed fixated on a car window of familiar, well-defined commandments. Jesus had set aside his predictable life and opened a door to untold, risky possibilities. And opening that door was every bit as frightening to the young man as it would have been to my sparrow. Suddenly the interior was not inviting but cavernous and full of danger. What Jesus proposed went against everything the young man thought he knew about living a godly life. Weren't his riches a sign of God's blessing? How then could God ask him to give them up? So he turned away and went back to the familiar life, the religious structure he knew. And from our vantage point, some 2,000 years later, we can see what he missed in that moment, what he might have experienced had he gone with Jesus. But for him, the obstacles blinded him to anything beyond his sacrifice. So I've always read the story of the rich young man as a story of total failure. After all, when Jesus opened the doors to the kingdom and told him what he needed to do, he turned away. He missed his shot. He didn't give up everything to follow Jesus. And I've pictured Jesus sadly shaking his head as he tells his disciples, a camel will go through the eye of a needle faster than a rich person will enter the kingdom of heaven. Sure, it's possible but not probable. 
Anyone watching the young man walk away can see the doors to heaven shutting behind him. But to read it that way is to misunderstand the conversation. Because entering the kingdom is not just a matter of getting into heaven. Entering the kingdom is participating in God's eternal reign at any given moment. In telling the rich young man to give his possessions to the poor, Jesus wasn't giving him a prescription for salvation. Giving everything away could never save him. That comes only through the gift of the cross. No, Jesus clarified what living life to its fullest in his kingdom looks like. It requires everything. It's denying yourself to take up your cross and follow. It's losing your life to find it. The challenge confronting the young man is the same one facing us every day. And like the young man, we often look for alternatives. We want a godly life with meaning and purpose, but we'd like it on our own terms. We like our windows, our way of doing things. Because when you stop and think about it, what God asks of us is frightening. Take up your cross, lose your life. It's impossible, really. And that's why we so often back away, choosing the safety of familiar routines over the uncertainty of difficult paths. The obstacles loom larger than the rewards. But Jesus never shakes his head and calls us a lost cause. He just keeps challenging us to let go of those things we rely on, our capabilities and our crutches, because that's the only way to ever break us free from any idea that we are somehow in control. We like predictability. But God continues to open windows, uh, doors full of surprises. We want provision. And Jesus tells us to feed the 5,000. We want security. And Jesus says, take nothing but the clothes on your back. We want smooth sailing. And Jesus invites us to step out into the water. Impossible is precisely the point. It's in our naked need that we find his strength, because that is where God is always at work, making the impossible possible. Those are the places where we come back changed, with stories of God's power, not our achievements. The poet Mark Nepo writes, once we admit we are not sure where life is taking us, then we are ripe for transformation. And that's what Jesus offers us all the time. Choices that leave us vulnerable. Opportunities that take us into the unknown. So that we may be transformed from a routine life into one that is rich and full, if only we can see it. He will allow us to stay within our safe, familiar confines, but he hopes for so much more. He came that we might have life. And so he wants to give us every opportunity to experience it. In following Jesus, any given day comes with the possibility of risk, of following the Spirit beyond our comfort zone of trying something a little frightening. But if we move from our familiar window to a door that God has opened, there's no telling what he might have in store for us. I'd like you to consider for a moment the windows in your own life. Where might you be stuck or frustrated 
caught in habits or routines that don't serve? And where might Jesus be opening an impossible door that holds promise? What might you attempt with the Spirit's power? And if you consider the life of this church, where are our familiar windows? Where are we following the same routine with predictable results? Where might Jesus be opening doors to greatness that are impossible except through faith and prayer? We're about to welcome a new minister after a year of uncertainty. What doors of opportunity is God opening for us here? And will we have the courage to go through them? For those of you who haven't met him, this is my grandson, Joshua. And this is my son, Jacob, and his wife, Erin, and our friend, Rhonda. And for now, we make up the praise team at the 1548 Heights. Um, and I apologize for my slowness. Um, it's a side effect of my treatment that I'm on. Um, I'm praying because there's people that say the side effects over a while. If you take it long enough, eventually they subside and go away. There's that possibility. So that's what I'm praying for, that possibility. Um, but today, we're going to continue to sing. And this is, I'm, I've been pr praying this, singing this, living this kind of my whole life. With all my life, I will sing of the goodness of God. And uh, to the best of my ability and my strength, tried to do that and bring along, <laughs> bring along others with me while we go about it. So Joshua's going to sing this for us this morning. So three, four. <laughs>
This morning after the benediction, we are going to gather around Randy Zeinert, who is going to be having a major surgery this week to reconstruct his jaw. And so I would invite you to move to him when this benediction is completed. This is taken from the message, and it's Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. May God, who puts all things together, makes all things whole, who made a lasting mark through the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice of blood that sealed the eternal covenant, who led Jesus, our great shepherd, up and alive from the dead, now put you together, provide you with everything you need to please him. Make us into what gives him most pleasure by means of the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 